came across works of one person, J. Stuart Snelson, about five years back, and it had, at least in my adult life, one of the most influence in how I think and I look at life. His, one of the best courses that I have ever done was a course called V50, and there are a lot of people who regularly come here from Calgary who actually bought the course and, and enjoyed listening to it. Anyway, I'm not here to sell the V50 course, but I'm here to let David Woodward, who worked with J. Stuart Snelson for a very, very long time, to talk about his organization and the course that he is working on right now. It will only take a few minutes. Mr. Woodward. Hi. Um, in 1972, a colleague of mine said, you should go hear some courses. I said, what are they about? He says, you'll like them. They help you think better. And with nothing more than that, my wife and I paid $15 each for a three session introduction to this course called the V50 Lectures by J. Stewart Snelson. I was hooked for life. Over the ensuing almost 40 years, uh, he became my best friend and my teacher and uh, many other things. Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friend. 1986, uh, he married Nancy, who's here with us today, and she is my business partner. We formed a little group called the Sustainable Civilization Institute to what I promised Jay as he was leaving this world was I would spend the rest of my life helping people have access to his work. Um, he's a giant. In my mind, he is an exceptional giant standing on the shoulders of the likes of Mises and Galambos and Hayek and going all the way back to Aristotle. After he stopped giving the V50 lectures in 1977, he formed his own company uh, called the Institute of Human Progress. We had a lot of fun with that name. And he started writing his own lectures from his own head and they're, they're quite different actually from the V50 lectures and I think very, very special. Our present goal is to get all of his lectures over time uh, transcribed, in print, available as audio lectures um, for anybody that wants them. They'll be available first and foremost on liberty.me. Uh, Rick Rule is kind enough to sponsor us and help us make this a reality. Uh, I'm working hard on it. It's been quite a job. It's, uh, I've got 1,500 pages so far just on his first lecture series that I'm working on, on called Human Action Principles. He pays uh, uh, Mises the primary credit for his inspiration for those lectures. And I am thrilled reading through them, editing them. Uh, I'm realizing that he has created something that might be certainly not the be all end all of how to build a civilization that is peaceful and will last forever. Um, but it's on the right track. It's the building block. It's, it, it's the pathway to take us from the way we've formed civilization since we climbed out of the trees which has been, all the way, tribalism. When I came over here this morning, I came by taxi cab. Before I got out of the taxi, the cab driver said, you're an American, which is it? Is it gonna be Donald or Hillary? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. And I frankly don't care. It's not important. Um, they're just two more wannabe tribe leaders. <laughs> These lectures are gonna show us, show you, show me, how to build a society where we don't have presidents and congressmen and so on. And I'm not gonna go into any more detail than that because I promised G uh, Giant that I'd be short, brief, but um, I think you're going to like them. Nancy is over here with a few of the things uh, that Jay has produced in the past, including his book, including uh, box sets of the V50 lectures. And she's ready to uh, take down names and, and uh, email addresses of anybody who wants to be at the forefront of knowing 
where we are and when we have something online ready for you to access. So please take the time before you leave to come over and see Nancy and get your name on the list. I think you're going to be really glad you did. It's special. Thank you. actually supposed to see that before I got on the stage. <laughs> All right, thanks, Giant. Uh, my name's Albert Liu. You know these two gentlemen on my left. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and we've had uh, a lot of great talks today, uh, serious talks, and uh, I guess information that I personally will be reflecting on for quite some time. Um, they've set a high standard. I'm not going to achieve it in this talk. Uh, this is a light talk. Compared with uh, what we heard this afternoon, what I have here is basically a cartoon. And it quite literally is in the sense that it's a uh, uh, ludicrously simple reduction of this question. It's uh, meant for fun. Um, so it actually came uh, lifted almost verbatim from an interview that Doug Casey did years ago maybe 10 years ago. I don't know if you remember, Doug. Do you remember uttering those words? Uh, yes, uh, about libertarians, yes. So you have to be careful what you say because uh, I've been thinking about this in the back of my mind for probably a decade. Uh, it's just one of those things. I actually don't know if it's true. It might not be true. And I actually don't even care if it's true. Um, whether someone is you know, wealthy or not wealthy is, is purely their business. I have a list of eight points uh, that I want to introduce and have the gentleman comment on. There's a couple that didn't make it onto the list. Uh, one of them is that what you do with your life, how you spend your time and how you hone your skills is really a matter of choice to a large extent. So the answer to this question uh, in large part is just due to personal choice. Um, I guess I didn't put it on the list because it's obvious and things that are obvious are uninteresting boring actually. So it's not on the list. Uh, the other thing that's not on the list is that uh, a lot of libertarians are extremely principled, so much so that they care more about principles than people. And while principles are important, if you don't care about people, you can't communicate. If you can't communicate, you can't persuade. If you can't persuade, you can't sell. And if you can't sell, you can't make money. Uh, so that's the start. Um, and then, uh, just as before I start, you've seen the first slide, so you know where I'm going. Um, this is meant as a joke, so all of you libertarians, in fact, a lot of these were just, uh, came as a, as, a, as a result of self-reflection, so they apply to me as well as to anyone else. Um, but uh, to all the libertarians here in the audience, and the many more that will view this later from their parents' basement, this is not about you, <laughs> this is not personal. Okay, and with the help of this panel of uh, older, white, rich males that I've assembled, he didn't say fat. Rick likes to add fat. I'm not comfortable with that yet. Personal appearances are off bounds, and uh, although they move slowly, they're still very dangerous. <laughs> like a couple of crocodiles sitting beside me. Okay, so let's go with, with number one. Libertarianism attracts losers. I pride myself on my preparedness, and when I made this slide, I was pretty sure that there was a back door to this place. <laughs> and uh, since there isn't, and that door looks pretty far away, I'm gonna explain what I mean by this. When I say libertarianism, I'm not talking about the philosophy. The philosophy actually attracts exceptional people. And when I say losers, what I mean is people with losing attitudes. So libertarianism, the minority political movement, tends to attract people with losing attitudes. We all know uh, who they are. We've seen them before. You can't get along at home. It must be your parents. Your grades are no good. It's got to be the teacher. Can't get a job. Blame it on the man. 
Can't find a date? Something wrong with women. Your life is not the way you want it to be. It must be the political system. So that's what I mean here. And uh, so I'm going to turn to the panel now, start with Rick Rule. Uh, let's talk about, um, I guess, the characteristics that would make one uh, pull themselves up from the mat after being knocked down 15 times, figuratively or literally. And uh, just as a, a matter of personal interest, could you confirm or deny whether the rumors uh, about that in the sense of your boxing career are actually correct or I exaggerated? I, I think 15 was an exaggeration, as I remember correctly, having talked to Winston. I was knocked down 10 times. And it's important to know that it was sparring. Had I been in a real match, uh, it would have been called. There would have been a technical knockout. And it would not have been able to be continued. The only reason that I succeeded in getting knocked down that many times was because the, it, it wasn't a sanctioned match and the referee let it continue. Uh, as to your reason, uh, I guess that means that libertarians that aren't losers are people who are smart enough not to get in the place and they get knocked down like that. But yes. Doc. As far as your boxing is concerned, stop fighting black guys if you expect to... <laughs> uh, libertarianism attracts losers. Uh, God, you look at the people that are attracted to the Democrats and the Republicans and the Socialists, they're all losers. Anybody attracted to political movements are kind of losers, quite frankly. I, mean, I think that applies to the Libertarian Party because look at look how stupid these 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 losers in the Libertarian Party are. They 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 nominated this non-entity, uh, Bob Barr, an ex-congressman, a couple of years ago, and now they nominated not just Gary Johnson wasn't bad enough, uh, but the, the, an actual neocon who is kind of an anti-libertarian, I think, is the vice presidential candidate. You know, and all these guys that you know spent most of their lives trying to be big fish in this little cesspool called the Libertarian Party. Look what they've done. So I'm sure they're losers. <laughs> I want to get a semi-serious answer. I think one of the things that happens is really twofold. Um, activists of any type, from an economic point of view, are losers. And what Doug was trying to say with that phrase is we were making plenty of penniless libertarians. So in the first instance, um, I don't think you necessarily measure success with wealth. My, my idea is that the essence of wealth is a sense of well-being. And in that sense, many of the libertarian, act, um, li libertarian activists are in fact winners. They're pursuing their passions, which don't happen to be economic. When Doug and I want to hang out with them, but we want to go someplace really nice and they can't afford it, it's frustrating for us. It's not necessarily a reflection on them. Uh, so I, you know, I think you need to define losers. The penniless part of libertarians, or particularly if you're from the anarcho-capitalist school, and there is the odd envious libertarian. I'm trying to be polite. Uh, that's been problematic for me, I think, I think, from my point of view. But I wouldn't describe the activists necessarily as losers, but penniless, uh, and that describes um, most libertarians. The other thing is that you know, there's not um, there's not a sufficient degree of avarice among most activists. You know that. The, uh, the idealists uh, generally don't have a chance to get rich. They are often more interested in ideas than money. And as long as they're happy, that's fine with me. Good point. This is kind of an important point, so let's get away from libertarians and just talk about the psychology of excuses. Some people are constantly making excuses for their failure. assessment and see why you won or lost, especially why you lost. And uh, you look at all the different factors and you can see, but, uh, and, and you might blame this or that or the other thing. Oh, I, I blame that enemy for being too well armed. I blame this enemy for being in much better physical condition than I was, you know. But actually, uh, as I've gotten older any time ever, 
anything goes wrong, after I experience my initial bout of being pissed off and blaming the world, I always blame it on myself because I personally believe I'm in control of my own reality. So um, anything goes wrong, I absolutely blame it on myself because I'm a solipsist and I think that I control this TV too. And I, I'm not kidding you. Not, not in reality, but in my own mind. <laughs> uh, I gave a talk here on that three years ago, I think, where I, you know, you quote the old Pogo cartoon about I've met the enemy and he is us, uh, that kind of thing. Certainly I've learned, and Doug did it philosophically, when I uh, look at my, at, at the things that have gone wrong in my life, I don't have to be philosophical about it, I can, I can point to concrete instances where <laughs> all of my worst wounds were self-inflicted. I don't have to think too far, all I have to do is observe what happened. I do think there's a tendency, and not among libertarians, I mean, I've seen all kinds of people make all kinds of excuses for failure. You know, my business would have succeeded except for that fucking Obama, right? Like, Obama didn't even know the guy. Um, in a common theme of mine in investing is that uh, there's political risks and there's economic cycles and there's all that stuff, but the worst risk is to the left or the right ear and to the right or the left ear. I mean, that's where the risk is. If you don't deal with that, you're done. Okay, um, before I move to point two, and actually that slide was up there a lot longer than I expected. <laughs> I was planning to just flash it and move on. Um, uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, two presentations we have tomorrow that I think are relevant to what we're doing here. One is by Dr. Michael Edelstein, How to Avoid Psychological Depressions Over Economic Ones. I've been really looking forward to this because, let's face it, who doesn't have uh, unless you're these guys, who doesn't have problems with money? And uh, I guess I should point out that where to hide it and how to give it away don't count as legitimate <laughs> money problems. <laughs> uh, the second it's, inter it's interesting having the rest moderate the West. <laughs> Uh, the second talk is by Dr. Walter Block, a friend of all of us. Um, there are some truths behind stereotypes. Nothing is wrong with racism and sexism. That's going to be interesting. If, you know, you have to give it to him. For a guy who makes his living defending the undefendable, why not, right? Why not just go after that? Um, at first I thought, what is he doing? This is... Uh, you know, it's kind of like a college football schedule now you get to pick your opponents. Why go there? Uh, but then again, if you're Walter Block, why not? You've climbed every other mountain. You should have been fired a long time ago, and somehow you weren't. You've had a wonderful career, so why not? But there is an interesting point there, that there is uh, some truth behind stereotypes. Uh, we might as well acknowledge those. Like, for instance, when my wife gets behind the wheel. It's uh, actually my uncle, too. Father-in-law? Okay. I made that up, but you guys were happy to believe it, weren't you? Do me a favor, a quick survey. Laugh if you're a racist. That's what I thought. Casey, rule, usual suspects. Do me a favor, smile if you're just a little bit racist. So you can't be full-on racist and a little bit racist. That doesn't make logical sense. Okay, but honestly, to, to be serious, if you talk like this, you do run the risk of getting in trouble, uh, like Walter Block has and other people have. If you're honest and frank, um, you're liable to get called up by one of these groups. I don't know exactly what they are, but I know they exist, the National Association of Asian something or other for equality, um, they're likely to give you a call. And I hope they do call me. And I hope if someone calls, it's a woman. Because as we all know, Asian women are super hot. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> The point of this, though, is that the whole process of wealth creation is collaborative. Okay, Robin's 
Robinson Crusoe doesn't arrive on the island and start erecting skyscrapers. We have to cooperate, and we have to cooperate with people who don't understand us. So uh, the rest of, the, of my time, I'm going to be uh, talking about libertarian idiosyncrasies and things that make it difficult for us uh, to get along. Uh, imagine taking my sense of humor to a typical office party. It doesn't work very well. Uh, so point number two is liber libertarians struggle with political correctness. <laughs> Doug, you literally wrote the book on this topic. Um, how does, I guess, uh, an unwillingness to go along uh, hamper one's ability to uh, participate? in the process. Well, I, I totally closed off my options for working for uh, uh, any real corporation uh, of any size. I mean, that was out of the question. Uh, you know, I can't do anything uh, uh, in uh, most of uh, society uh, for, that, for that reason. Because once uh, it turns out that uh, once we, we do a couple of minutes on the weather and on the state of the roads and on some sports team, which I couldn't care less about any of them unless I had money on them and I don't know enough to bet on them, so forget about that. Uh, then it's, I like to talk about something of substance, philosophy, and that means what is practical and applied philosophy. Uh, it's religion and politics, the two things you're not supposed to talk about. So. Um, uh, but those are the things that are most fun to talk about, that are important to talk about. Those are the things that actually move the world. So, um, uh, I'm sorry that uh, this is such a prison planet full of all these stupid chimpanzees, but uh, I must have committed some great crime elsewhere in the universe to be planted here. <laughs> Rick, you've held a variety of different jobs. Um, including working for mainstream investment <coughs> banks, uh, and running your own firm. How did political correctness affect you? Well, I guess it's probably fair to say I sidestepped political correctness as best I could. I'm also not one that's really willing to wage, uh, <laughs> despite the fact that in my boxing career I managed to get knocked down a lot, I'm not one that really wants to step in the ring against seven billion people. So I think, you know, you kind of have to pick your fights. People haven't really expected political correctness out of me. And I think one of the jokes that you made earlier about the fact that um, libertarians think differently than other people, I think thinking differently than other people is the key to financial success. And I would suspect that the best tools that libertarians have is when you discuss with libertarians the idea, first of all, that you have to generate utility more utility than you consume in order to become wealthy. Libertarians understand that. And most of the people look at you, and most of the people in the world look at you and say, oh, God, that's an interesting idea. You know, might have to do shit like save. Got it. The other thing about libertarians is when you, not necessarily the libertarians are capable of being contrarian, but the idea of being contrarian is politically correct among libertarians and not among other people. Um, the truth is that when you attain a certain stature in economic society, being overtly politically incorrect is, without joking, a felony. And so you have to be, you, you have to protect your firm, uh, <laughs> you have to protect your firm very actively. Because we, although we make a joke about political correctness, acting in a moral fashion against the dictates of political correctness uh, is, other than a social risk, it's a legal risk. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very good point, Rick. And, um, it's prudent and intelligent to watch yourself to, to a great degree. Because look at the example of H.L. Mencken, who, uh, in an age when being politically incorrect wasn't nearly as dangerous or fel felonious as it is today. But during both World War I and World War II, he dummied up. Because he realized, you know, that when all these chimpanzees start hooting and panting, 
Um, and they realized you're not really one of them, they'll tear you limb for limb. So he made himself low profile. So it doesn't bother me so much because my my favorite my favorite movies, The Wild Bunch, and of course everybody's favorite scene in that movie is the final scene. So, you know, what do I care? Just a little story from my end on uh, political correctness. You guys know Peter Schiff. He got in trouble some time ago. I went on The Daily Show and they basically uh, locked him in a room and uh, got him to talk until he said something offensive. Okay. 30 seconds, please. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, but he slipped up. It was, a, it was kind of a hatchet job. And so he accidentally said mentally retarded uh, when he really wanted to say intellectually challenged or whatever the, the acceptable, but he couldn't find the words. And so they, uh, they put that on it and he took a lot of flack for that. I don't agree uh, with what they did to, them, to him. I think it was a horrible underhanded thing. But I do agree with word substitution in some cases. And this one in particular for two reasons. The first is, if I can make someone's, someone or their family feel better simply by substituting one phrase for another, I'm happy to do it. But the other thing is words have precise meanings. And one of the things that makes these gentlemen such effective speakers here is their diction. Okay, and words evolve. So mentally retarded evolved to just retarded, which in playground vernacular has a precise meaning. And that meaning is someone who acts like they have a mental deficiency, but have no clinical excuse. Here's an example. Who are these retards commenting on my YouTube channel? I don't get very many of those, and I think it's because, for the most part, we run a pretty civil message board. And trolls online are like the internet equivalent of dung beetles. If you starve them for food, like any other organism, they eventually starve or have to go somewhere else. Okay, I want to go to number three, and that is uh, libertarians don't conform to established social groups. I went through a motorcycle phase, and when I was in that phase, I was pretty much agnostic in terms of the machines themselves. I love all machines, I have an engineering background. But it seemed like I got along best with the Harley guys, or they got along best with me. This picture is not going to stay up very long. That's me with my buddies about 10 years ago, looking like an adopted puppy <laughs> in South Florida. We used to ride all over the country, me and these guys and other guys, and funny things would happen. We would ride and we'd stop to go into a restaurant. We'd walk in, I'd be in the front for some reason, with these guys behind me, and the waitress would look at me and say, table for one. <laughs> it happened more than once. Libertarians don't conform uh, to uh, established social groups, Doug. I want to talk to you because you count among your friends professors, entrepreneurs, millionaires, billionaires, warlords, uh, central bankers. Uh, talk a little bit about that, the diversity of the network. Well, uh, some time ago I realized that I, uh, you know, where you're born and what the social class, uh, country, race, religion, uh, these are just accidents of birth. So it's up to you to uh, orient yourself uh, the way you'd like. And this is true of other people as well. So I can find people that uh, I share values with uh, anywhere. So I'm very uh, eclectic and omnivorous in finding friends. Uh, I get along with a lot of people if we share some values, and uh, I've got some weird, weird friends for that uh, reason. I mean, uh, I'm, on the one hand, like any person, I'm a racist because you realize that, you know, you see a bunch of ill-dressed, loud young blacks walking down the street for you, yeah, 
Yeah, you're going to be a racist. You understand exactly what's going on. You identify him by race. That type of thing. That goes on all the time. Uh, and it's intelligent. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I've met people in the Congo that uh, if I had a daughter, I'd rather see, it, see her marry one of them than I would the average American, quite frankly, because they're intelligent, they're civilized, they're Western. Exceptional, I agree, not many of them, but I tend to seek those people out. So, um, you know, I judge people strictly as uh, individuals. Uh, that's all there is to it. Mr. Rule. I guess I sort of experienced diversity through Doug, you know. Um, most of my, uh, I have a very, a fairly narrow range of interests, and so I probably fit into that statement fairly well. In, in the context of penniless libertarians, and the fact that libertarians don't necessarily conform to normal social groups, I'm not sure that that's a problem, one or another. I'm also not sure it's true. I mean, I think if you, uh, Look at everybody in the room, maybe the thing that uh, unites us is freedom. But I suspect if there's 90 of us, that there's uh, <laughs> 900 vectors. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I agree with that. I just don't think I agree with it. Okay. Uh, the next point, number four. Libertarians speak a foreign language. We talk about things like... NAP, non-aggression, voluntary slavery. This stuff doesn't make sense to the average person. It sounds absurd, actually. And uh, it's no wonder that we have so much trouble with persuasion. Um, I want to give you an example in my own personal life. I uh, love my mother-in-law very much. She's a devout Christian lady, very nice to me, very nice to my kids. Uh, I enjoy visiting her. Uh, but she has a problem in that she was permanently scarred by the energy shortages of the Carter era. So she doesn't like to see lights on in rooms without people. And when I first started visiting her, I thought I was going insane because I'd be reading in a room, I'd get up to go get a cup of tea, come back and the light would be off. 30 seconds later, this kept happening. One time it happened when I was in the room. She didn't see me. All I saw was this five foot two black blur, the light turning off and the street going away. So I asked my wife about it. She said, well, this is it. This is the problem. They lived through that crisis. We developed habits. And I said, okay, because I'm a stupid recovering engineer, I had a talk with her. I said, look, 60 watt bulb, two hours a day, 30 days a year, average 15 cents per kilowatt hour. We can afford this. It didn't work. So then I thought about it. Then I came up with a new method. Remember, this is a deeply religious lady. I said, Jeanette, Mom, didn't God say, let there be light? <laughs> I'm not an expert, and I don't mean to lecture you on scripture. But I recall that was fairly early as well. They may have even led with that. And I think it was a pivotal moment, meaning that if he said that and nothing happened, would have uh, maybe undercut what came after, or if it, the lights came on and there was a black streak and they turned off. <laughs> Problem solved. Um, gentlemen, do we speak the wrong language? I know that the two of you I think have had a lot of success in part because you speak a universal language that is money. You know, I, I don't like to uh, talk down to an audience. Um, so, uh, I'm, no, I'm no Christian, but one of uh, the sayings of Jesus that I think is very wise, he said, let those who have ears hear. And I think libertarianism is actually a genetic mutation. So that simple words, even if they're very simple, uh, can't change somebody's basic psychological and spiritual makeup. So um, uh, I just, 
say what I say, and there's a certain percentage of the people that are listening that are ready to hear something or haven't heard it that way before. So uh, I just, in my own case, I just do what I do and let the law of large numbers play out, understanding that uh, the number of libertarians uh, in the world are we're way over on one side of the bell-shaped curve. Not many of us. Well, I, uh, I have to say, and Bonnie would uh, corroborate this, guilty as charged. Um, I know often in frustration talking about libertarian principles that are important to me, as opposed to uh, persuade, I have often bludgeoned others, which is not a really good way to convert them. I have tried to learn from Doug, who has been a master at attracting people to hear him from the basic human emotion, which is of course greed. Um, his direct mail promotion says make 609% over a long weekend, and so he draws very large crowds. And of course he tells them that they can do that if they believe in libertarian principles, which is really, really wise. Um, I myself have <clears throat> tried to adopt this, insert freedom messages in speeches where I've attracted people uh, because of my market skills. Uh, since you've given me the, the ability to be commercial here, I'll do it. One of the things that I would encourage you to do is read Doug's action-adventure novel, uh, where uh, he turns all these things on, the ear, on, on their ear. The hero is the villain, the villain is the hero. Uh, there are great libertarian messages for many people laid on a little thick, for me never having seen these messages in an action-adventure novel, it's absolutely delightful. And I think not speaking, I mean, the thing about going to speak a foreign language is a real criticism of us, is that in attempting to communicate, we talk, but we talk in a way that the other person doesn't hear. And Doug, I think, has done a great job uh, laying that message in uh, an attractive, convenient, and mostly friendly rapper. Okay, Doug, you mentioned that you think, I think you mentioned this last year at this very conference, that libertarianism uh, is a mutation. It could be, it could also be a virus too, because I think you're the one who gave it to me. I'm going to summarize my own conversion to libertarianism. Um, Harry Brown basically lured me to the edge of the cliff, Doug snuck behind me and pushed me over. Uh, meanwhile, I learned recently that Rick Rule was behind the scenes helping to finance the whole darn thing like an anarcho-libertarian George Soros. Okay, um, but, but actually these guys have taught me a lot. Uh, how to look at the world, how to generate wealth, how to give a good talk. Uh, they're two of the best speakers I know of and they're probably two of the best bar none, bar none uh, listeners and observers I've ever met. But it's come at a cost. And uh, this is probably not the right time, but I've always wanted to ask you guys, do you accept any responsibility for what you've done to me and other people in this room? And more specifically, the spouses whose lives have been utterly ruined by our conversion to anarcho-libertarianism? Um, you, uh, <laughs> you can't just go around prescribing red pills to everyone you see. In fact, Doug, the uh, young lady who introduced you today, her story about having dinner with you, that's not the first time I've heard a story like that, the, of you uh, corrupting the young minds uh, of America. Yeah. Um, you gotta fill those out of hours somehow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, that's, that is interesting because if uh, one person uh, in a marriage uh, starts seeing the world through this prism and the other person doesn't get it, it'll break up the marriage. Do I feel bad about that? No, not particularly. It, it meant that the marriage was built on sand to start with, so, you know, no loss. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think I can get a little lower than Doug. I have to try. Um, I just heard libertarian, you know, libertarianism described as a virus. Maybe if we wanted to spread the message faster and further, we could call it a social disease, which you always have fun attracting. <laughs> Let me give you an idea of the personal cost that I've suffered. Um, 
like you or like many of you, uh, I had to endure the uh, inconvenience and indignity of traveling by air to get here through uh, the U.S. airport system. Uh, I always had trouble with this, but I think since I discovered Doug, uh, my dealings with the bottom 1% um, airport employees has, has, gotten, uh, has gotten very bad. Uh, you know, when you come to the security checkpoint, there seems like there's hundreds of people there in blue uniforms. There's always one person barking out instructions to you. This is terribly annoying to me. I have sensitive ears. One time I went through, got to the end, and found the person in charge and asked him, I understand that you have to do this, and I understand that you need to communicate instructions to us. My question is, why do you always have the stupid guy do the talking? I said, what? <laughs> this conversation took place, for real, in my imagination, <laughs> where I seem to be living more and more of my life, due to a number of reasons, but for one, the necessity of self-censorship. Doug looks confused. Rick, can you explain to Doug what self-censorship means? <laughs> The reason I know for sure that it happened in my mind, and not for real, is that I'm here with you, not in a Dallas jail. Entrepreneurs make money by uh, understanding the world the way the world really is, and uh, the way it will be in the future. Uh, unfortunately, libertarians create unnecessary trouble for themselves uh, by living sometimes in a fantasy world of justice and morality. Gentlemen, any comments? Well, certainly that slide in conjunction with airports could be confirmed by the fact that uh, Bonnie, Adrian, and I have frequently traveled point to point from somewhere to somewhere in conjunction with Doug Casey. And none of us will be in the same security line with him. If there's eight lines and he's a number two, we are invariably a number seven. So there are occasions that Doug might, by the way, not consider the trouble that he causes uh, unnecessary. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a low threshold of requirement to tell you the truth, and uh, so I like to get a rise sometimes. Uh, I don't do it as much as I uh, as, as much as I once did. Uh, Adrian, you were there that one time we were coming back from Bermuda, where uh, you remember I asked the guy who was going through that guy. I said, uh, uh, "When did you first?" There was a guy, and I said, "When did you first discover that you like going through other men's dirty laundry?" <laughs> I don't think you can say that to these people today without bad things happening. So I've, I've, uh, I've taken, it, uh, taken it down a, a few notches. But the thing is, is that uh, I, uh, you know, I, I'd like to be a skilled actor to present whatever image that I'd like, but that's not really among my skills. And these people can tell. They can sense the way a dog can sense if you're... Uh, afraid of them or something like that, they can sense that I'm a hair's breadth from reaching down their throats and ripping their lungs out, but I'm completely under control. So it's just a problem. I don't like to travel anymore. I want to speak to that because Doug not only makes trouble for himself, I, um, I read Doug's stuff. It's an endless source of amusement. And I remember in one letter that Doug actually charged people for, he actually receives compensation for this. He advised his readers to um, treat airline employees the way they would treat a contemptible insect. <laughs> the, 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 the government people. So as opposed merely himself to uh, asking these people if they enjoyed pawing through other men's dirty underwear, he was suggesting the people who paid, for, paid him for advice on how to get on with their life um, invite physical violence or jail. Uh, well, just incredibly irresponsible. Well, I understand that, and, and I know you're right, Rick, but uh, 
I'm, I'm trying to help people feel better about themselves. I'm trying to help people regain some sense of self-respect, which most Americans have totally lost at this point. Okay, I got to keep things moving along, so I'm going to speed through six and then get the panel to comment on seven. Number six is libertarians are preoccupied with free markets and government interference, right? We hate government interference. In fact, I hate the government's involvement at all. Uh, when I'm presented with some type of application, whether it's a college application or a job application or anything else, I hate the part where they ask for the voluntary information about your race. It really bothers me, so I always leave it out because I don't want their help and I don't want them working against me either. Uh, but sometimes it's mandatory. When it's mandatory, I, I will check the box that says Asian or Pacific Islander. But I cross out Pacific Islander because I hate those people. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Okay, but really, regarding government interference, Libertarians hate the idea of zero interest rates. We hate the idea of QE. We hate the idea of massive government intervention. And the reason is because we know that when they do this, capital is wasted left and right. Mostly left, as Murray Rothbard would say. Um, so we don't like to participate in that. Uh, we don't like monopolies. We don't like cartels. And I actually have, I guess, unhealthy fantasies about getting back at some of these cartels. Uh, I'll give you an example. Wouldn't it be neat if every time you went to purchase a product or service, you had to reveal what you did for a living and who you worked for? Government workers would starve. Uh, but imagine some of these other cartels. A guy comes into a mechanic shop with his car, says, my car's running slow. Who do you work for? I'm tech support at Comcast. Cable company. Interesting. Let me ask you a question. You have a router connected to your modem at home? Yes. Go home, disconnect the router, come back, tell me about your car. What does that have to do with my car? Nothing. Guy comes into a hospital, says, I'm here for my wellness exam. Who do you work for? I'm a vice president at Goldman Sachs, investment banker. One colonoscopy coming right up. <laughs> Okay, let's get to number seven. Libertarians are obsessed with conspiracies. This is very unhealthy. Um, sometimes, when I'm feeling naughty, I'll look into these. My favorite one right now is that the First Lady is actually a man. <laughs> this is absolutely hilarious. I couldn't resist. And there's a penalty for this. You know, if you go out of character on YouTube, your life has changed forever. But I couldn't resist. I was expecting some lame attempt to prove this. Photoshopped pictures. They started with, look at her finger, look at her shoulders, look at her forehead. I'm thinking, well, this, this is, you know, not very convincing. And then finally, they said, and what about the penis? Of course, they didn't actually produce one, but there were some pictures with a strange cup-like bulge. And again, you got to give it to them, right? Because if you're going to tr try to prove this case, it doesn't get much better than a penis, does it? I would have led with the penis, forget about the finger and all that other stuff. Lead with it, because let's face it, time is short. There are lots of conspiracies out there. Let's just get this one out of the way and move to Pearl Harbor. Okay, so gentlemen, here's my question for you. These conspiracies uh, leak into the financial world as well. The gold price is rigged, so on and so forth. Can you talk about where you stand on those? I work in a place called Sprott, so I'd like to invoke my Fifth Amendment right. So, I, I think they're ridiculous. I mean, all markets are manipulated. I think we've proven that. But no conspiracy ever lasts. Uh, I, I've been operating in Vancouver for 40 years. I've seen a lot of stock rigs. And the longest a stock rig can ever last is two months before the guys who are trying to fuck everybody else fuck each other. I mean, they just don't work. That's a good point. Now, there are a couple.
constantly conspiracies between everybody against everybody else. It's just the nature of life on this planet that that, that goes on. But I, uh, very few of were successful, and very few last for more than a very little while. It's just like, just like Rick said. So uh, I'm not obsessed with conspiracies. I, I think they're interesting and amusing, and sometimes right. But, you know. Yeah, I'm off to run with them. Okay. Before I get to number eight, which is the last one, I just want to say it's, it's not all that bad. Uh, it's good to be, take a positive look at things. Any liability can be twisted around into an asset. And if you need proof, just look at the Federal Reserve. The balance sheet has 4.2 trillion of, quote, assets uh, on the balance sheet. Uh, but here's another example. Uh, racial stereotypes can be turned around. I can go to New York City, walk in any building, commercial, residential, government, without being stopped or even questioned. All I have to do is change into street clothes, stop at a local Chinese restaurant, take that bag of food, and just walk in. This is New York City. Someone there has ordered Chinese. If you were working the door, would you stop me? Here's another example. Uh, Doug and I have bounced around the idea of uh, maybe doing a book. The natural choice would be a financial book. But I think maybe I could uh, contribute something to the uh, lowly libertarian. Uh, so I have three ideas. I was going to share them with Doug later, but what the heck. Share them now. Uh, the first book, Seven Employment Ideas for the Hardcore Unemployable. <laughs> I started this project 10 years ago. I'm stuck at zero. Uh, number two, productive use of awkward silence. I just sent six emails. And then the last one, making the most of your airport detention for those of you who are traveling home by air. Okay, last point. Libertarians create services for other libertarians who, as we've been discussing, have no money. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.